Welcome to the Scholars Forum in the Catholic Intellectual Tradition. The forum consists of faculty talking about their recently published or soon to be published books related in one way or another with the Catholic intellectual tradition. It takes place on teams, usually every other week on Wednesday at 4 p.m. This is the last of this semester, but not the last of the year. The forum is sponsored by the University Court, the Catholic Studies Program, the Catholic Studies Center, the Department of Religion, and Immaculate Conception Seminary School of Theology. It is an exciting expression of harvesting our treasures, and our faculty scholars truly are among those treasures. Jesuit philosopher Bernard Lonergan said, a university is a reproductive organ of cultural community. Its constitutive endowment lies not in buildings or equipment, civil status or revenues, but in the intellectual life of its professors. Its central function is a communication of intellectual development. So in light of that, we are pleased to welcome our fourth presenter for this, our second year of the Scholars Forum, Professor Alan Wright, who teaches both in the Catholic Studies program, which includes core three is his class that he teaches in classes, and in the Immaculate Conception Seminary School of Theology on his recently published book, Lock Arbor, A Hidden Life and a Tragic Death at the Jersey Shore. Dr. Inez Mirzaku, Chair of Catholic Studies, will give the introduction. And I wanna mention also that Professor Maribel Landrau, Assistant Director of the Corps, will help in coordinating the question and answers. Dr. Mirzaku. Thank you so much, Dr. Enright, and uh, it's really a pleasure, but at the same time, you know, a great honor for me to introduce my dear colleague, um, Professor Wright. Uh, we are really grateful, Ellen, for all your contributions to Catholic Studies, and I'm talking only about Catholic Studies because <laughs> I read, you know, the, uh, the, the students' evaluations for your courses in Catholic Studies. Ellen actually has uh, come up with, uh, um, actually developed uh, a spirituality uh, of work course uh, together with Julia. You have, I know that you have worked very uh, closely with her. So it's spirituality of work, a very, very popular course that Ellen has been uh, teaching for Catholic studies. Actually, it has become a must course for the students in the business school. And of course, you know, this course is also a core three. Uh, course. And also another course that Alan teaches for Catholic studies is the spirituality of sports. Again, a very, very popular course. Again, a must take for the students, for uh, business students, but sports, especially the sports management students. It's a lot of wit, a lot of wisdom, a lot of scripture that uh, that Alan very, very masterfully, you know, uh, conveys to the students. Uh, besides, you know, his theological uh, uh, knowledge, which in fact, you know, is is shown in, Ellen, this is the eighth book, actually, that you have written? I think it's about the 15th or 16th. Oh my goodness, I have lost count <laughs> terribly. 15 books. But who's counting? Okay. Yeah, it is, it is amazing. You know, your track of publications, it's really stunning. And at the same time, besides, you know, uh, teaching for Catholic studies, uh, Ellen has also been the, um, the academic dean of evangelization for the Diocese of Patterson before he, uh, so this was before he, because now he is the, the principal of Koinonia Academy. And I know again from students that they get, they get so much knowledge from all uh, these experiences, you know, these life experiences that you present to the students, which is really extraordinary. So in the name of Catholic studies and also of the core, because all your courses are core, <laughs> core three courses. I know Nancy feels the same. We are very grateful for your uh, for your contributions, Ellen. So uh, the book Personally, when I saw the book, because we are friends on Facebook with, with Alan, so I was just keeping track, you know, and not keeping track actually of his uh, publications. So when I saw this new book, I said, wow, this is a different style, but really very, very interesting because there is history there. It is mystery there. It is, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a murder, a right kind of murder. And at the same time, it's healing. And I was interested in all this, uh, this pieces and how Alan kind of put this together which is historical fiction because it's not only fiction right, right. so uh, and that is this fascinating 
uh, 15th book that Ellen has brought uh, to, to us, you know, uh, and to the audiences uh, in general. So uh, now the floor is your, yours, Ellen, just to, uh, to give us some more information about this book. Thank you. Great. So thank you so much, uh, everybody here, for putting this together. And it's always a, a pleasure for myself to drive onto the campus of Seton Hall and to interact with the students. And thanks be to God, we're, we're masked up, but we are face to face. So that's a, a great joy for me. You know, the final product is right here. The book is called Lock Arbor, as we said in picture there. This is the final product. Besides thanking you all, I want to thank my relatives for taking some great pictures and actually labeling them, which is invaluable. How many people have family pictures? And I think that's my grandma as a child, but who are these other people? Both on my mother and father's side, they labeled pictures. Thank you <laughs> for over a hundred years ago. So I'd like to really divide my talk today, maybe into three parts. Number one, sort of a little bit my family history. Uh, Number two, sort of recreating life on the Jersey Shore between 1910 and 1915. And the third part, really crafting a narrative uh, from a divergent point of view, adding some elements which are certainly consistent with the Catholic intellectual tradition, adding in sort of, you know, moments of grace and, you know, a little subtly there as well. And because I am sort of involved in evangelization as sort of as Catholics, that's our call, that's our command of Christ to share the faith which is always a movement of the Holy Spirit, that desire to share the faith, how we do it sometimes is not a movement of the Spirit. And so I really was conscious of how does this nurse that I have in the story gently draw out the story and, and what goes on. So first, my family history. My father passed away in 2010. And up in his room, he always had a big chest of photos. And I would go through them once in a while and be a little fascinated with them. Uh, and then when my mother got sick, uh, I would go over to the same house and visit with my mom, but I would go into that room and I would take out some of the pictures. And here's a picture of my uh, great-grandfather, right? Asbury Park, 1913. There he is there. Uh, a picture of my great-grandmother, his wife, Hattie Beauregard. She died of Bright's disease, which was a kidney disease, in 1910. So leaving my uh, great-grandfather to raise six children on the Jersey Shore as a carpenter. Previous to that, uh, they lived in Newark. Uh, and here's a picture of my grandmother, 1910, uh, at a doorstep in Newark. I'm also part of a Facebook page called Old Newark, where people post old pictures. Somebody recognized this porch. They contacted me. And if you do follow me on Facebook, I do often recreate some photos. I had my 17-year-old daughter, we drove to that house, and I had her sit in that same position. So I like doing things like that and making history come alive. My great uncle Bill, he uh, ran off to join the army. The, the Asbury Park Press had a headline, he was missing. No one knew where he went. Uh, he got on the train, went to uh, the from Asbury Park up to Newark and join the Marines. If you go, there are two entrances to Ocean Grove. If you go on the far entrance, I think it would probably be the southern entrance, right before you go there, there's a big World War I statue with names on the plaque and at the very top, picture of a, a statue, bronze statue of a soldier, William Beauregard, my great uncle, is on there. So the, these, this part of history at the Jersey Shore is always very fascinating to me. So while I was going through these pictures, I recognized my grandmother. I recognized my Uncle Bill, who died in the 1980s, who I, you know, a beloved character in my life. Uh, my Uncle Wilson, Uncle Lawrence, uh, I knew them as a, as, a, as a boy and as a young teenager. My Aunt Marguerite died in the 1950s. I never knew her fun looking at pictures of her and my grandmother frolicking in the Jersey Shore in the water, full-length bathing suits, 1913, 1915. And yet I would find a picture, and I only have three of them, of this other person that was included in family pictures. And his name was Lewis. And I'm going to show you, uh, I guess, the three pictures I have. Here it's kind of blurry, 
But there's a family picture, 1913. And right over here is my grandmother. And that's probably about a month after my great-grandmother passed away. The next picture I think is very revealing. This is my Aunt Marguerite with Lewis. And Lewis looks a little bit like a thug, if I may say so. An oversized jacket, probably a hand-me-down. But just one moment in time, right when that camera snapped, the expression on his face, He's right here, he's uh, 13 years old. He looks like he's a, a tough guy. And finally, this picture here from where I got the cover of the book uh, is this family photo. And there's Lewis right there. And he almost looks like a little bit like James Dean. the a good looking young man. And here's a, a blow up picture I have of him. So I come across this picture, I discover he must be a family member, but I don't recall my grandmother, my great uncles, my dad. Nobody really recalls anything that happened to him. Who, who was this Lewis? And my grandmother would say, you know, almost ad nauseum, I raised those boys. To which my mother, after years of hearing this, would sort of roll her eyes. But in truth, my grandmother really did raise that family because my great grandfather was working as a carpenter and she was the oldest. Her mother died when she was 13. So she really lived in an age where, you know, she really ruled the roost, as they say. So who is this person whose name is Lewis? You know, some casual reading of newspapers, uh, newspaper.com, Asbury Park, you put in the name Beauregard, things come up. It was like the, the newspapers back then were sort of the social media of the day. If you had a party, and I invited Ennis and Maribel and Nancy and Todd, and you know what? What music was played on the Victrola? Dainty refreshments were served. All this was in the newspaper. So I got a little bit of a glimpse of that life. Still sort of a dead end. So I contacted uh, the archivist for the Neptune Public Library wonderful woman named um, Marie uh, Boundman. And she said, okay, I guess not many people contact their archivist. <laughs> so I guess she's kind of bored. But she said, okay, I'll, I'll get back to you. About a week later, she responds. There's a little picture, you know, posted stamp. I click it, and this is what I read. Okay. And I said what Todd just said, an ice pick wound. I said, you got to be kidding me. You know, I was expecting maybe pneumonia. Maybe he got hit by a donkey or early automobile. You know, some sort of common disease. I said, an ice pick wound causes his death. I said, oh, my goodness. And so I did a little more research and found out a lot more, not only about that incident, but about the family. And so they grew up in two places during this time period, in West Grove. And if you know Ocean Grove, God's Square Mile on the Jersey Shore, uh, a Methodist community, very strict, very Puritan. Uh, even today, the auditorium still stands where they have these meetings. There are still people living in tents uh, in the summer months. Beautiful area, beautiful Victorian homes. So they lived on Five Stokes Ave, and then they moved over to uh, Corliss Ave in Asbury Park, right? So I get this story, and I said, oh my God, I, I, I can write. I wonder what life was like. So I began my story in 1910 with the death of my great-grandmother and sort of the travails of what happened to uh, my great grandfather raising these children. I knew my great uncle, the one who went to fight in World War I in France. He worked at the Asbury Park Press as a printer. My grandmother worked as a seamstress uh, part time. And you could get some school records, what they were doing in their church activities. All this was in the newspapers, right? And at one point, my great grandfather tried to have Lewis uh, 
scared straight and arrested because Lewis was skipping school. Money was missing in the house. And I can imagine my great grandfather sort of being at his wits ends and hey, you know what? Arrest him, scare him straight. Well, he goes before the judge, Lewis and my great grandfather, and the judge, the title says scores, really screams at my great grandfather. And it's on the front page of the Hedbury Park Press. Two days later, my grandmother at age now about 16 writes her reply. If Lewis is so so good, how come the teachers send these notes? How come money gets missing? How come, you know, a lot of things are going on in the family, right? But also I discover, because they were very religious, uh, Methodist, and then it seems at some point they switched to being Baptist, that Lewis got involved in a local youth group called the Barakah. In Hebrew, that word is for blessing. Barakah, different ways of pronouncing it. So it seems that perhaps he was on the right path. And so signs of hope, right? So I had written that, and then what happened? My great-grandfather, who was a carpenter, wanted to deliver a message from Asbury Park to Allenhurst. And in between Allenhurst and Asbury Park is a very small strip of land. It probably encompasses less than 200 yards of beachfront, a town called Lock Arbor. And while on December 18th, Louis P. Beauregard was delivering a message, he crossed from Asbury Park into Lock Arbor, and it seemed he was accosted by some boys who threw snowballs at him. And it seemed that Lewis was the type of kid that was not going to take it standing down. So I imagine him putting his bike to the side, and it's him against a number of boys. The weather forecast did say it snowed the previous two days. So there was some snow there, which is kind of strange in Asbury Park. And they had a snowball fight. And in the midst of the snowball fight, someone on the other side picked up an ice pick and threw it. And it had to be one of those one in a million chances. It went an inch and a half into Lewis's temple. And from there it was just chaos. I probably have seven or eight articles from the newspaper giving updates on Lewis's progression. They took him to the Ann May Hospital in Spring Lake. And on April 15th, 1916, he died. So he lingered for about four months in and out. At one point, the doctors drilled another hole in his head to relieve the pressure. Again, in hindsight, probably did more damage. Uh, and ultimately, they say the cause of death was blood poisoning. So when you're writing a novel, novels usually begin at about 50,000 words. So I, th I did a pretty good job, I think, of writing that story of what happened from the day they came down from the cemetery, Hamilton Cemetery in Neptune. Uh, it's about 10 minutes from the Stone Pony in Asbury Park. And again, I have this picture uh, of my Uncle Wilson, my grandmother, and Uncle Lawrence at that cemetery. So these two graves here are still there. So when I, the first time I visited, I didn't know where he was buried. So I looked for those markers and I found the grave where my great grandfather, where Aunt Marguerite is buried. And this youth group also had a ceremony for him. And this is a picture taken, I guess, the day of his burial. And these young men are in uniform, part of this group, the Baraka. So at that point, I had no idea who threw the ice pick, what the story was, and I had about 20,000 words written. I thought it was good. But for me, the climax of the story is that, what, the ice pick is going in the air, it hits him in the head, he screams, and he's in the hospital, and he dies. That's sort of the, the crescendo. So I, I just sort of waited on it. And I just, you know, let it resonate a little bit. And finally, I went out to, to lunch with a, a former student. And he just sort of said out loud, which I think had been, I had said probably 100 times, I wonder who threw the ice pick. 
And I finally, after doing more research, found an article that two weeks after Lewis died, the ice pick thrower came forward. And his name was Charles White. He lived at 1526 Asbury Ave in Asbury Park, and he was 12 years old. The same way that my jaw dropped when I saw ice pick wound killed my great uncle, I just sort of was deflated, a 12 year old. And I said, what's the punishment for, you know, what's the counseling? What's the, this was obviously a moment of anger. He got it and just threw it and a one in a million chance. And then I started to think, you know, what was life like for this young man? The newspaper article said that he was remanded to the care of a former mayor of Asbury Park, who was also a dentist. And that's the last bit of information. I tried to look, there was a youth home in New Brunswick. It's a common name, Charles White, getting records from over a hundred years ago. You know, after a couple weeks, I just said, you know what? I just, I don't think I'll ever know what happened to this young man. But then I imagine this is where sort of the, the, the Catholic conscience comes in, right? That no information was found about him, but I thought, what was his life like? So I situated a story out in West Texas. So my wife grew up in Sweetwater, Texas, four hours west of Dallas, famous only for the world's largest rattlesnake roundup. So if you need vacation plans and you want to go to a rattlesnake roundup, four hours in an hour west of Dallas, there's nothing. So you go another three hours and there's Sweetwater. About 20 minutes out of Sweetwater, there's a town called Roscoe, Texas. In Texas, every 20 miles along Route 20, there's a town because the steam engines needed to fill up with water every 20 miles. In this town, Roscoe, was where I situated the story. Roscoe, Texas, as a town, literally died in the 1970s when the train stopped going through. They didn't tell the inhabitants who live there today that the town died. So it's sort of a depressing town, 70% unoccupied buildings, and it's just a place you sort of shake your head and say, who lives there? Now, we're from New Jersey, right? And we're often the butt of many jokes of being from New Jersey. You know, when I see people and they come to New Jersey, it has to be for a religious purpose because only God sends people to New Jersey, right? Nobody from Florida says, I want to live in New Jersey, right? I want to, why are you here? God must be involved, right? So, but at the end of the day, as sort of I sort of give Roscoe a bad name, this is where this moment of grace takes place. So if it can happen anywhere, and most of us don't have the, the luxury of choosing the time or the place of where our final days will be. So I had it at a uh, sort of like a hospice situation. And this man, Charles White, it's now 1978. He's in his 70s and he's dying. And his time is limited. And really where my sort of Catholic imagination uh, picks up is, uh, you know, certainly the incarnation, that God became flesh. So I, I was looking for somebody that could really incarnate and be an agent of grace to this young man, or now this old man, who had been carrying this burden for 60 plus years. And it impacted his marriage, impacted how he saw himself, relationships, jobs, and so it was really something that was uh, fun to do. So the nurse, and I call her Abigail, Nurse Abby, develops this relationship with her patient. And we have a Seton Hall student uh, graduate uh, whose brother is Gregory Floyd Jr. I'm sure many of you know Gregory Floyd and also Gregory Floyd Sr. But her name is Therese. And Therese graduated from Seton Hall as a, a nursing student. So I did lean on her a little bit. You know, what, what's the, the boundaries of a nurse speaking about faith, sharing faith? And again, as John Paul II says, we always uh, propose 
our faith, the person of Jesus, we never impose our beliefs on the other. Right? So I didn't want to have her be a, a forceful comment. Here's a man in a vulnerable position. And yet she could sense that something was not right. And so through being in this gentle bedside manner, drawing out questions, and whenever she would get sort of, you know, close to something that was bothering him or maybe the heart of the matter, uh, she gave him more line, more room to speak. And yet his defense, you know, mechanisms of either blowing her off or using sense of humor or diverting with a different story, she'd always find a gentle way to, to get back to what's going on in this man's life, right? So again, this nurse becomes really this outward sign of God's mercy, and it's not just empathy, but really it's this compassion of moving the story forward, this active listening, asking good questions, uh, and not forcing this man's response. But also there's another character in the book, and this man, his name is Hank, and he's a old soul as well. He's in his late 70s, and he's the, the janitor. And he sort of develops a little relationship because each day he has to come in and empty the garbage. And Charles White, who's on his deathbed, finds out that this janitor used to work for NASA. And he's like, well, NASA? What are you doing being the janitor here? And so Hank tells a little bit about his story, about being really smart and really, really respected. And yet often neglecting his family, partially being maybe a, a little bit of an alcoholic, and finds himself looking back just wasting time. Didn't spend the proper time with his kids, with his wife. And in that facility, his wife died of cancer. And his way of giving back is to serve through not only emptying the trash or being the janitor, but also being a voice and a companion and a friend to those there as well. So in terms of evangelization, the gentle way of asking questions, of drawing out from the nurse is there. But Hank is somebody that can speak man to man with Charles. Hey, we're both old, right? I'm not going to be living another 10 years. And you may not be living another six months. And we need to get serious with about what is our purpose? Have we been honest with ourselves throughout our life? You know what? And as someone who worked for NASA, who's going to question me? I lived most of my life as the smartest guy in the room, and yet I made some pretty bad mistakes. Right? I was more, in, you know, more invested in things, and I didn't take the proper time for my wife, for my kids, for my family. So he was able to speak and really to be respected by Hank. By Hank was really respected by Charles, no one had ever spoken to Charles that way before. And there's a little bit about, you know, moral relativism. And, you know, Charles tries to go down the right, well, whatever you feel is true is true. And Hank is like, uh-uh, there is truth. And you need to make peace with that. So this honest and forthright discussion, really sort of dispelling the, as we say, the dictatorship of moral relativism, uh, that recognizes nothing as absolute. And Hank is saying, you know what? Yeah, I have found something in my life. And, you know, I'm going to put that forward. This is what I believe. You need to find that place because you're just going to, you've been in a quandary for, for many years. And so he sort of comes in and comes out as well. In the midst of this, this nurse, because if you do follow me on Facebook, or talk to me, I also love old diners, right? The older, the better. I don't care what the food tastes like. Just give me the, the, you know, the steel on the outside and the, the train cabinet, and I'm happy as can be. So I have a diner transported out to West Texas, right? And the nurse meets with three of her friends. The last name of all of those friends is the first name of the companions of Job. And what do the companions of Job do? They discuss suffering and really try to give different perspectives. And so one of the friends of the nurse says, well, maybe this is a small price to pay. You don't know what this guy did. 
Maybe he abused his wife. Maybe he killed somebody. And the fact that he's feeling some torment, good. That's justice, right? You don't know what evil he did. Another voice chimes in, right? Well, haven't we all made mistakes in life? Don't we all deserve compassion, a chance at redemption? And so there's a conversation that sort of goes around the diner, which I love. <laughs> if, I don't, if I don't mind me saying myself, that, uh, that really does sort of reach in a little bit to the story of Job. And, you know, how do we deal with suffering in our life? And who has the right to forgive somebody for something they did to somebody else? So one of my favorite plays is by Simon Wiesenthal. And it's called The Sunflower. And it's a remarkable story about a dying SS soldier who's only 21 and he's looking for forgiveness. And in a concentration camp, they bring in a Jewish person to hear his confession. And then the Jew does not, he just listens. And he goes back to the barracks and tell his story to his other Jewish companions. And they have a, you know, who are you to forgive this person? Well, he looked upon me as a representative of other Jews. And he told me the horrific thing he did. It, you know, so it's really an amoeba. It's, it's no really final answer. And so I, I wanted to raise that and give sort of a different point of view, different perspectives for the, for the reader to say, hey, what would I do for those situations in my life that what would I do with, in this situation? Anyway, to move the story along, she does see on his chart that he's Catholic. And in terms of that outward expression of inner sorrow, he finally confesses, and that's where I do a little flashback. I tell the whole story of them growing up, and then, boom, this is what happens. He confesses. I have the nurse, who has a friend who is a librarian, to do a check to see if any of Lewis's relatives my grandmother and great uncles, if anybody's still alive, he finds out, yes. And so she writes a cover letter and then asks Charles if he would be willing to write a letter of apology to my grandmother and to uh, three of my great uncles. And he does. And so you get to read in my book, the cover letter from the nurse, uh, who is young, but she has wisdom. Right, patient wisdom. Uh, and then he writes to my grandmother and three of my great uncles. The letters come back. And I will cut to the chase. My grandmother speaks, was a very religious person uh, and does forgive. My great uncle, who served in World War I, uh, was a victim of mustard gas by the Germans and was rendered sterile. So he never had children with his wife. He knows the horror of war. He too says there's enough anger and, you know, stuff in the world, I forgive you. My uncle Wilson, no way, uh-uh. You're only sorry because you're dying and you're afraid of what comes next, right? How about us? I haven't had peace in 60 years. You robbed me of a relationship with my brother and. And the other uncle uh, doesn't respond. Again, that question mark, right? That sort of a unknowing. So I wanted to give the reader an opportunity to maybe have a conversation. What would I do if someone had taken a, a relative, a brother, many years ago, and now they're seeking, you know, forgiveness? So there is a character, uh, and it's a good friend, Father Dennis Berry, uh, from the Lead, uh, the uh, what, executive of the Shrine of St. Joseph, who is just a very holy man. He's uh, coming over to dinner uh, tomorrow night at my house and uh, just a, a very holy man. So I have him. Uh, Abby says goodbye to Charles on Friday. I'll see you on Monday. Abby comes in on Monday. Here's the news that Charles had passed away. Okay. She's one of the few people that go to the funeral. The priest recognizes her and says, are, are you Abby? I, come here, let, let's go to the rectory. I, I need to talk to you. And he says, you know what? Every Sunday, 
He walks to the uh, hospice facility because he has a couple people that he regularly sees and visits. He walked by Charles's room and Charles yelled out, hey, father, right? He came in and the priest says, I I'm not going to tell you what he said. But previously, Abby had said to him, you know, this idea of confession is holding on to garbage in our life. Right. And the longer we hold on to it, like if I outstretch my hand with a glass of water, it doesn't remain the same. Over time, it becomes heavier and heavier. And how do we release our grip? And as a Catholic, you know, Charles says, well, my first confession was my last confession. Right. And it's been, you know, 70 years. It ends up the priest says, you know what? He emptied his garbage, that he got it all out. And so there is sort of a poignant Catholic moment there of confession. And uh, there is some peace. And then the story ends, that chapter ends 1978. I fast forward to 2017. My dad had passed away. I'm visiting my mom. I'm going through this big chest of all these pictures. And I find a letter written by the nurse. And this is fiction, of course. <laughs> People who have read the book, that's the first question. Is the nurse, or did you, you know? I read the letter, I get on Google, I see that she had just retired, I find out who she is, and I end up meeting her out at a barbecue place in Texas. And uh, after some, you know, some brisket and some, you know, some ribs and some sweet tea, I sort of end with, tell me about Charles White. And that's really where the, the story ends. Although the nurse, as she puts her pocketbook down, you can identify a couple letters that are sticking up. So if this becomes a bestseller and it's a movie, there's gonna be a sequel. And so those letters, you know, I was thinking, it was nice that Charles wrote to my family members seeking forgiveness and honest repentance. But I said, I do say in the book that Charles was divorced. He was married and had three kids. I said, you know what? He should probably write to his wife and kids as well, for he never told them about what happened. And that might bring some, maybe not healing, but maybe just some understanding in their lives that you know, sometimes we say, if I only had the words to say, if I only had the tools to, to get out, and that's why the beautiful sciences of psychiatry, right, and psychology to help us in counseling, to help us put words, and especially to, to children, right? To, this is the emotion that I'm feeling. And while Charles was an old man, emotionally, he was still a 12-year-old dealing with these thoughts and feelings and trying to get them out. So if there is a sequel, uh, I'm going to have one of, uh, what? One of Charles's kids be a student of Abby and their, their paths will have crossed before without her knowing who this, this nurse is. Because there's a doctor in Roscoe, Texas that recognizes that this woman is pretty special. And he suggests to her, as much as I love you being here, we're in Roscoe, Texas. You know what? Have you ever considered going to the university in Austin and studying to be, maybe studying in the field of geriatrics or, or you know, getting a further education? So 40 years later, when I meet up with this nurse, she is now a retired dean of a school in Austin where she has made a career of not only the art of nursing, but also the, I guess not, not the science, but really the art of nursing and having that bedside manner to draw out what people, because we, we're looking for the, the total healing of the person. And so, my friends, that's my story of Lock Arbor. And uh, again, those Catholic elements of, of grace, of being an agent of grace, of unresolved guilt, of mercy, compassion, you know, how do we deliver the message of, of our faith? Like I said, the desire to do it is of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes, you know what, we need to be honest with people.
Sometimes we need to develop a relationship first and maybe look for that opportunity. First Peter 3.15 says that every opportunity be prepared. It doesn't say ramble on 24-7, but maybe how can we be attuned? Hey, maybe this is an opportunity to, to steer the conversation this way in order to draw out something that will bring peace and healing. So if anybody has any questions, I'm more than open to answer anything. Wow. wow. Any questions, professors? Mm -hmm. Alan, that was absolutely fantastic. I mean, that was <laughs> that was that was that was a riveting story, and and uh, and and I, I like how you drew on your 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 own experience of kind of going through the letters and and pictures. I guess not the letters, but the pictures with your with uh, your mother's house and and the, and kind of the research that you did in your own family and uh, finding out about your um, uh, I guess Lewis is that would be your uh, grand Maybe. uncles, yeah, grand uncle. Um, had you written fiction before? No. Okay. Yeah, I, I haven't tried that either. So I, just, I have lots of questions about that process. So you, you said you wrote your story first, kind of the parts you knew. Did you kind of embellish a bit around that and kind of make up conversations with them? Or did you, you keep it pretty I, tight to the script? You know what? I, I think just my imagination being at the cemetery, imagining what life was like, and I had him walk down uh, the preacher because their pastor was educated at Drew University. I guess he wasn't smart enough to get into Seton Hall. <laughs> like I said, he was he was Methodist, so right. Drew, Drew was very Methodist at one point. Uh, so I would would able to add that in. His homily would be something that I would say, mm -hmm. and a little quoting of scripture and giving hope for the family, but really despair. At one point, my uh, great grandfather who my family, my grandmother never said one word about. He went missing for three days. And this was 19, maybe 1914. It was in the newspapers. Nobody knew where he was. He ended up in Belmar. The last people saw him, he was on his wheel. That's how they would say if you were riding a bike. They saw him leave a meeting on his wheel, and then he's missing for three days. The logical thing is that he went on a bender, right? And uh, was probably drank. Back then, the archivist said that that was one of the leading causes of death, bad alcohol, because he didn't know where it came from. And so he recovered from that. And the last record in any censuses or anything that I have of him is 1920. His gravestone says 1951. There's no record of him. So one of my uncles, the uncle that responded to the letter very harshly, his son, Wilson Jr., is alive, lives in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I drove out to meet him. I said, do you have any word at all? And the only thing he said, he said that he was an alcoholic. We would say an alcoholic. In 1920, you're a drunk and you're living on the street. Uh, so Wil Wilson Jr. told me that the other brother, Lawrence, was also sort of a functioning, functioning alcoholic, but he was a millionaire. He had a seat on the Wall Street Stock Exchange. He was with uh, some sugar broker in New York, and he found the body buried in a potter's field and had it exhumed and moved to Hamilton Cemetery in 19, you know, uh, where his marker is 1951. So my father was born in 1956. He never mentioned his grandfather, mm -hmm. which would be, you know, in hindsight, you just don't know the questions to ask. Mm -hmm. Or again, if I would have asked my grandmother, or what was Lewis like? I just have these three pictures. Mm -hmm. And one of them where he looks like he's a little, you know, a tough kid and Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm a principal of a high school, and most of the kids here are really nice, but, you know, 13, 14, you get a chip on your shoulder and get that, you know, I think of the Wizard of Oz with the, the lollipop troop, those little tough kids, right? Uh, but crafting the story, I, I, have an, I had enough from that newspaper site that I could really piece together the youth group. Uh, there was gangs active in Asbury Park. 
the population uh, swelled 20-fold over the summer months. And so for a kid not in school, easy to get in trouble, father working on construction projects. So everybody here familiar with Asbury Park? So if you're walking from, on the boardwalk toward Ocean Grove, mm -hmm. you have the burnt out casino. A friend calls it Beirut on the boardwalk. Because <laughs> it's just, you know, and I've taken some cool photos there. But once you go through there, on the right hand side was a prestigious North End Hotel. The newspaper articles are fabulous about the electric lights, about the cherry wood, about the guest rooms about the opening of it, the bands that played. So very descriptive, and I use that in the book as well, as my great-grandfather probably helped build the boardwalk, but also I, have, I know for a fact that he helped build the North End Hotel. So getting into some of those details was very informative for me. And uh, like I said, I was stuck with about 20,000 words. And it wasn't until I said, let me kick in that creative imagination. What was this guy doing the rest of his life? And so he avoids the ice pick incident, but I have him working in Newark and through some Facebook pages. And some, my family also moved up to Newark uh, in the 1920s. So having some of those photographs, doing a little research about the, the breweries in Newark, Westinghouse, what the factories were like. So when I was 15, to about 25, I worked part-time in a factory in New Providence called uh, Ethylene Corporation. So some of the guys that were very, you know, that I loved working in a factory as a young kid, everybody calls you the kid, right? And hey, come over here, you know? I sort of incorporated some of my experience working in uh, shipping and receiving, working uh, in a machine lathe, working in maintenance, working in quality control into his life as well crafting what his experience was. And then finally the war brought him out to Texas and Air Force Base, and then sort of being familiar with that area because my wife grew up there. And every summer we got to go back. Thank God they got barbecue because, you know, <laughs> but so yeah, it's, you know, that, that starting point. And once I said, what was his life like? For me, I, I just write, write, write. My problem is, I think everything I write comes from the hand of God. So I'm humble enough and smart enough to know it's probably not that. So uh, I do show it to some of some people that I respect and say, you know what, I think this is good, but what do you think? Is it too much or what should I edit out? Uh, I do include verbatim most of the newspaper articles about their life. One criticism I got from a gentleman uh, was, you know what, it, there was a lot of, and again, it might be 12 or 15 newspaper articles that go right, the same verbiage into the book. And I said, you know what, a little bit of it can be repetitive. And I, so I said, you know what, you're probably right. But because this is my family history, I'm going to keep it anyway. So it's, you know what, let the reader be bored a little bit for a page or two, but you know, hopefully down the, the down the road this will be something that my kids will will enjoy. So the cover, uh, a friend of mine, a former student, who died about six weeks ago, named Sean Kelly. He uh, graduated in my first year of teaching. We became friends. Went to a lot of hockey games together. Sean Kelly graduated Union Catholic 1987, uh, and then went to Syracuse and got involved with a lot of uh, artistic design. So he was able to craft that picture from Lewis, from this picture here. And up here is a actual photo from Asbury Park in 1910. And below here is a one of the newspaper articles sort of superimposed there that Beauregard Ladd is close to death. So I think the cover, it really sort of, you know, you look at the kid's face and I think the eyes are just like staring at you. But I think it's the type of thing that you look at it that you sort of want to like lean into it because of the the picture in the background. So I was I'm grateful to my friend Sean uh, for doing that for me. So 
I got a question, uh, Alan. Sure. I can see why your students love your classes. Uh, you are really, really so engaging. I, I just got a big. I, I found that so interesting. My mother was born in Asbury Park, as a matter of fact. So, and really? You know, oh, great, great. Yeah, we know this area like really well, my family. Uh, and I know that that uh, carnival thing that's burned. Uh, that always was a little creepy to me when I was yeah. a kid. You know, with the clown face and everything. Uh, it, it's. Uh, but I, I have actually two two questions. One, one is about your fictional part. I found that so fascinating how you just switched into this fiction and, and, and just it's so creative. You should think about writing more fiction, I, I would say, uh, as an English professor. Uh, but um, are, like I know you mentioned Father Barry. I know I've heard Father Barry speak and I know, you know, I, a couple of times and he's a great guy. How does he feel about being in the story? Like you put a real person in the story, but also are there prototypes, like real prototypes for the nurse, for Abby and for Hank? Yeah, so Hank is was the is a real person. So I teach at Coiny Academy. It's a you know plain field, yeah. twelve acres. It's the building hasn't had any upgrades in years. Hank and his wife, uh, Hank retired. Hank's job was to put satellites up in the space. Before Hank, Hank Sewell, if you had GPS, it could get you within about a hundred yards of where you were. He was part of the team that developed the technology to put it almost right on your body. So Hank is a tall, lanky guy, narrow face, overalls, shirt, but he worked for, I don't know, McDonnell Douglas or something like that. When he retired, he devoted his life to serving this school as a groundskeeper. So when I'm writing about Hank, it's, and Hank read the book as well. And we had a beautiful hour and a half conversation about it. And Father Dennis has just been such a dear part of my life. He married my wife and I, wrote the introduction to my first book. First met him in 1994. I did some volunteer work in Capulene, Colorado for his order. And we just became friends there. He got shipped out to New Jersey. And uh, so I think the way Father Dennis speaks, if you know him, it's, oh, you're, you're, you're. and he really says, Abby, you know what? You're doing it. You're where God wants you to be. I can only meet so many people. You're there on the front lines. And so Father Dennis's order has as their tagline, every Catholic and apostle, mm -hmm. right? Every one of us has a mission. Every one of us is sent. And Father Judge, you know, 100 years ago, wanted to empower the laity to go out. So Father Dennis sees that here's a woman that's doing the work of being patient, Again, Pope Francis would say what? To accompany those on their journey. So it's not just, hey, do you believe? You don't? Okay, I'm moving on. Whether you believe or not, I'm still going to be your friend. And I'm still going to accompany you on that journey. So uh, I had to put Father Dennis in there as a priest. The other priest in there is Father James Valentine Daly. On my mother's side of the family, two of her... So two of my great uncles on my mother's side were priests. One was a Marian old missionary uh, who died a couple months before I was born in 1964. And the other, James Valentine Daly, was a graduate of Seton Hall University. I have his sheepskin, literal she diploma, which is huge. And thanks to uh, Alan Dozier, right? He um, was, he was uh, a couple years ago, I reached out to him. Are there any records? Where did he go to high school, seminary? When was he ordained? So Our Lady, ah, the church in Orange, New Jersey, St. John's in Orange. I think Father Peter West is a pastor there now. That's where he was ordained. He, uh, that was back in the day when there was only one diocese, just a, just a diocese of Newark. And uh, he was stationed in Marstown as well. And he died of a heart disease when he was about 35, 36. So I... I, I included him in the story as well as a little wink to my mother's side of the family. Beautiful. I, I just, you know, I just love the way you weave in these these real characters. That's, of course, the way all writers work, you know, bringing in the, the like I'm sure I think of James Joyce's Dubliners and the kind of stuff you're doing here is, you know, you can just see it in, in what he wrote. Uh, and, and just, to, you know, I know you mentioned that the these people are Methodists. I went to Drew, as a matter of fact. I got my doctorate there. Uh, it, it it's it you know it, where did the Catholic come in? I mean, is there like would was it a marriage? Uh, you know what? My father's my grandmother 
and grandfather didn't go to my parents' wedding because they married a Catholic. How sad is that, huh? Yeah. And so even, you know, you, you don't realize this when you're a kid because grandma is grandma. And you love right. grandma, right? She gives you $2 and she gives you candy and she, you know. But growing up and then you sort of see the relationship and the growth, I think, in both of all of our churches and yeah. being much more accepting. Yeah. And now, you know, when I was on the Commission for Interreligious Affairs with you, yes. you know, Catholic Islamic dialogue, Catholic Jewish dialogue, all these things are so important. Yeah, we have disagreements, but what can we agree upon? So yeah. I think Charles is a little bit like me because the way he deflects and has the ability to deflect somebody asking him a, an honest question. My wife always says, Alan, just answer the question. If, some, if you were to say, where did you get this blue shirt? I said, you know, it's a nice shirt. You know what? When I was driving out to the Bridgewater Mall, and it would take me 10 minutes to say, <laughs> right? That's you too, Mary Bell, right? <laughs> so he's a little wordy and he can deflect, but ultimately the nurse, who I think maybe that, that compassion is a combination of some people in my life that you want to sort of have the best of, uh, non-judgmental, but she is firm. Right? She's loving, she's wise, but she's not going to let him get away with this because yeah. she knows he needs to get to that point and he knows he might have six weeks, two months to live. So Beautiful. And I got to say just my, my weakness is grammar. So I think I really, I think I know my strength. I think I, when I present, I can be engaging. I think I can tell a great story. That's what got me writing in the first place. Mm -hmm. But the grammar, and so I did have somebody look it over and even after that uh so i think now the book is in in very good shape but it's, that's not my that doesn't excite me i don't think it probably excites anybody the grammar part of it but it's very important to tell a good professional story so I, absolutely i do know a couple of people who get excited by grammar but i think that's only in English <laughs> probably the archivist and a couple other people right <laughs> i actually do myself angela weisel two of us but um that I just loved your story. I thought it was wonderful. Anybody else have a question or anything that they wanted to ask Alan? And Nancy, if there's anybody you think that would be interested I, over at Drew, I'd be more than happy to send them a, a free copy. I do have, you know, mentioned Drew by name and the pastor. Those are all historical facts. So I'd be more than happy to donate one to their library or something like oh, that. Oh, beautiful. I'll find out. I'll find out for you. If they're interested, okay. yeah. Yeah, no, I, I love Drew. I had a wonderful experience there. So I'd be very happy to have a reason to connect with them. So listen, this was absolutely terrific. Uh, I think everybody, I can tell by the faces I'm looking at here, everybody was enthralled by this. And it was just so well done, Alan. Thank you so much. Anytime. Uh, it was Thank it was you. a delight. And, and anytime you want to come back to the Interreligious Dialogue Commission, I know Father Phil will <laughs> have you back. So, because we've yeah. lost a few people, but yeah. anyway, God bless you and thank God you. God bless you. Again. Thank you so much, thank Anna, you, Alan, for inviting me and Todd and Nancy, <laughs> Maribel. God bless you. God bless you.